And so our founders said we hold these truths to be self all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. This is what government does. So don't tell me, I don't want government involved in this. This is between a woman and her doctor. No, no, no. no. Don't tell me this is above your pay grade. If you're going to be in government, this is what you're supposed to do. For, the, for this cause, government, governments are instituted among men. To, to first of all, you, you preserve life. Then you can do overpasses and sewer systems later on. But first of all, see, see, life, and then notice the sequence, life and then liberty. See, liberty is of not much value if you're dead. <laughs> and so you have to have life first, then liberty, then the right to pursue happiness. And all of those lead to abundance. As you cramp down in the right to pursue happiness, who can start a business, what are the taxes, the regulations, that are, and then you take away their liberty and eventually you can even take away their, their life. At the time that the United States was doing that, there was a, in 1787, when, when our founders were meeting in Philadelphia, there was a revolution going on in France at the same time. But that was during the period of the Enlightenment, as you know, and so we don't need God, right? We're smart enough, they're not, we're beyond that. And so the French had their theme, and that was that they believed in liberty, equality, and fraternity. And just like our leaders, when they dismiss themselves, they say, God bless America. And the French, they always say, when, when uh, Chirac gave his last speech to the nation at the end, he says, liberty, equality, fraternity. It's on, it's on their coin. Now, what does that mean? Fraternity, what's another word for fraternity? Group. What's another word for group? Union. What's another word for union? Soviet. Because of my, my Soviet, because of my group, because of, of, because of the group that I belong to, I have equality. That means, how do you get equality? Well, you take from someone else. The only way you have equality is you take away things from people. Where you have freedom, you have inequality. Those that during different times of their life. Some want to work harder than others. Others want to spend time with children when they're young. Other times they want to work harder. If with freedom, you have inequality. Some want to go to the ball game, some don't. But to have equality, the poorer the nation, the greater the equality. A lot of equality in prison. Just a lot of, everybody, same food. <laughs> lots, lots of, you, don't have, you don't have freedom, but you have equality. And so, so when, when your group, because of my group, not because... God may be, but because I'm Hispanic, or because I'm a woman, or because I'm this, because of my fraternity, I want to demand certain things. Equality, and what happens when you take th things away from people? They object. What happens when they object? Well, you've got to kill them. And so the symbol of the French Revolution was the guillotine. And so whenever these folks took power, Pol Pot in Cambodia, two and a half million dead. Adolf Hitler, 12 million dead. Six million Jews, six million Catholic priests and others. When we, Liz and I were in the Soviet Union, we'd always ask our minders, how many people do you think Stalin killed? Neighbors were, uh, the numbers were always in the neighborhood of 60 million people. Our history books say 35 million, no matter how you slice it. Death, death, death. See, without God, there's no protection for life. And those who want to take life always want to separate us from God. And so, the guillotine, the symbol of the French Revolution, was liberty, equality, fraternity. The theme of the American Revolution was life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now let me, while I'm on this topic of equality, let me explain why it's unwise for government to come in and take things away from people. When you go to buy something for yourself, you care about two things. You care about price and quality. And nobody can judge that as well as you can. I mean, you might pay $3 for a uh, cup of coffee at 7 in the morning. You wouldn't pay 50 cents at 2 in the afternoon. So it, only you can judge how much you want to pay and the quality of something. And when you buy something for yourself, you s spend it very, very wisely. When you buy something for someone else, that's called a second-party purchase, you still care about the price because you're paying for it. <laughs> but you're a little more flexible on the quality. <laughs> Yeah, that's where you say, green, I think she'll like it. <laughs> now, let us suppose that where you work, everyone that comes to work late has to put $5 in the kitty. 
And at the end of the month, the boss says to somebody, take all the money in the kitty and go buy something. We'll raffle it off, and that's the penalty for people being late. And so it's your turn. And they say, John, uh, find out how many, much money's in there and buy something. You count out, there's $150. And so you go to lunch, and you're coming back, and you think, what am I going to do with this? And lo and behold, you look up there in the store window, and there is a six-foot-tall stuffed frog. <laughs> and you think, you go over and you check the price, $149 perfect. This is just great. So you buy the frog and you go back and you stuff it in the closet. At the end of the day, the boss invites everybody down, lectures to them about being late. We can't do that. And all right, who wins? Everybody pulls a number out of the hat and who wins? Sally, the new secretary, she wins. And so what does she win? You go open the door. Here's the six foot tall stuffed frog. Everybody laughs and claps, thinks that's just the funniest thing in the world to go out and shove it into her car. She drives off. Now what's that? <laughs> that is called a third party purchase. A third-party purchase is purchasing something with money that's not yours, therefore you're not concerned about the price. To purchase something you will not personally consume, therefore you're not concerned about quality. Now, remember I said I was going to pause for effect three times? Here's number two. <laughs> Listen to me now. This isn't Democrat, Republican, conservative, labor, left-wing, socialist. Thing. By definition, all government purchases are third-party purchases made with money that's not theirs to purchase things they will not personally consume. Therefore, will there be waste in the highway department? You betcha. Will there be waste in the defense department? You can count on it. Every time we take a dime away from a person to save and use and invest to the maximum of benefit and run it through the third-party purchase system called government, we are in the process of making our nation poorer. America is the richest, most powerful nation on earth for one reason because we do less of that than any other nation. If you ever had the privilege of serving Congress, you've always got some person standing up screaming, we're the only nation that doesn't do this, and we're the only nation that doesn't do that. I would say, thank God, you've got 180 nations to go to. This is the only place we can go to. Why is it everybody's crawling over cut glass and barbed wire and leaky ships trying to come here if it's this is so all fired bad? The fact is, the greater the freedom, the greater the wealth. And every time we take money out of a person's pocket, because we're compassionate and caring and all. We're going to steal it from them. And the, and the politician's just there to help, you understand. And so when they go to do that and run it through this system, they make the nation poor. So you show me what percentage is controlled by government, what can, of a state or of a nation, and you can tell the greater the poverty. It's not complicated. Now here's where I want to put in a word about being very careful about some preachers who like to come along and say, well, this is the compassionate thing to do. To which I respond... I take a Bible, and I say, show me one verse. Show me one verse where God ever called upon the politician to steal from one person to give to another. He talked about helping the poor. He called upon you and me and the church. He never called upon the politicians and the government to do that. So don't act like you're all fired sanctimonious when you go around using your... your your stormtroopers to go steal from people's pockets. If you want to help them, brother, then you belly up to the bar and do it. And that's what America really truly does. This is the lighthouse for the gospel. This is the most generous nation on earth. When somebody feels hurt, when a, a little girl goes down a, a, a well, when a person is in trouble or their house burns down, this nation buries them with help. In fact, they get so much that they don't know what to do with it all, as we saw in New Orleans and elsewhere. That's what America does. So don't let some of these politicians come along and, and stand together with someone with a collar to saying that this is the noble thing for you. You're being selfish if you're trying to protect and provide for your family. You should be doing this. Let, you should have, have their priority system. Fact of the matter is, you and I were called to do that personally, not by stealing it through the, church pro through the government process. So